Father, when we hear this parable, we are quick to write ourselves into the good soil. We want to be sons and daughters who produce 30, 60, 100-fold fruit in our lives. We do not want to consider the other soils, either for our friends and family or for our church. And yet, above that, Father, we want to hear you speak to us this morning. We want this parable to allow us to see into your story. We want to get a better understanding of your Son, Jesus Christ. We want to know know more intimately the Holy Spirit that dwells in us, that by grace and his power, we can live lives that bring you great honor and glory. We ask, Father, that you would be gracious with us this morning by communing here. We cannot worship you unless you are present. And you promised whenever two or more are gathered that you would be, and there are more than three here. And so we ask for a mighty anointing this morning by your Spirit. We know that we have a tendency to people who hear but do not hear, and see but do not see, but not this morning, Lord. Let us hear every word you proclaim. Let us see Christ more clearly this morning. And let it have such a radical impact on us as a church that we are forever changed and in being changed impact this community and your kingdom. We are thankful that you've gathered us here this morning for this distinct purpose. That we might sing to you and pray to you and have a sinful man like me proclaim the gospel. We ask, Father, for your hand of blessing to be upon us. I'm afraid we are far more in the other soils than we are in the good soil. We don't want to remain there. So change us now for your name's sake. I ask all these things for Christ. Amen. Good morning. I'm going to have to tell Brandon not to have all I have is Christ anymore before the sermon. On the one hand, it compels me in the pulpit to want to preach. On the other hand, it causes me to cry so hard I can't speak. And that's a bad combination. You need to speak in order to preach. Um, I pray that that song moves you as well. That you realize that when you sing all I have is Christ, that is not a deficient statement. If you have Christ, you have everything. I pray that he is your life. I, and I pray that's revealed here in our, our teaching today from the parable of the sower and the seed. If, if you don't have your Bibles open to Matthew 13, please do so. I want you to, I want you to see the word with your eyes this morning. We, uh, we started last week technically, but really a few weeks ago in looking at Psalm 42 and Revelation 21, but we officially started a new series last week entitled God's Story Unveiled. And I gave it that title because I I want us, as we move through Matthew 13, which is known as Jesus' parable discourse or his sermon on parables, and then we'll move through Matthew 18, which is known as the discourse to the church, I want us to use these parables by his grace to look into a larger reality. I want the window to be opened up for us so that we can see this glorious story, this creation, fall, redemption, restoration story, which is God's story, which are you, you are part of that story. You have a part in the story if you are in Christ. And so by his grace, we will be able to see that over these next several weeks, God's story unveiled to be lifted up, to be made known to us. We're picking up In Matthew 13, which is kind of midstream in the gospel ministry, Jesus is out doing public teaching. He's in Galilee, which was his home province, very likely near his hometown. And we find that he's doing teaching here, and the the crowds are coming to him, not so much to hear what he has to say, but because he's offering special things like healing and food. And so they're coming to him in the masses, and so much so that he wants to do some teaching 
And so they're on the seashore, likely of Galilee. There's some debate on that. And he gets into a boat and he just rows off, you know, a few feet so he can actually teach without being overwhelmed by the crowds who want to be healed. And as the, as the multitude stand on the beach listening to this teaching, our Lord begins to teach in parables. And if you weren't here last week, we looked at why he did that in verses 10 through 17. A parable is a story. It's a, it's a mini story. And it's intended to reveal a bigger story, a greater story, which of course is God's story that we want to be seen. The parable we saw last week, each parable serves two purposes. I pray you remember this. One is grace. One is to give the believer a better understanding of who God is, who Christ is, what happened on the cross, what it means to be saved by grace through faith, to get into that story deeper. But there's another side of the parable, and that is a side of judgment. For all those who refuse to hear and who refuse to see, they will remain confused. They will hear the parable, but not understand the parable, at least not its spiritual understanding. And so Jesus begins here with probably one of his most famous parables. I remember even before I came to a saving grace, not being raised in the church, I had heard this parable. I did not understand it, but I had heard it. And it's a very simple parable, but its teachings, if we have ears to hear, are truly profound. He begins with a farmer, also called the sower, but it's a farmer. I can identify with that. Now, as a non-agrarian culture, this, should not, this still should not be difficult. The teaching is really simple. There's a farmer who's out sowing seed. In this particular case, it's seed of grain. Now, during our Lord's day, they would go out, a farmer would go out, and he would till the soil just like today. And in Palestine, most of the, most of the plots were relatively small. And after the so soil was tilled, the farmer would go out and he would scatter the seed generously because he didn't want any dirt left without seed. No seed, no fruit. And so he would sow it generously in the tilled field. Most of these fields were small plots and they had perimeters around them, usually walking paths. And sometimes that seed would fall on that path. And sometimes it would fall into the rocky soil. And sometimes it would fall into soil that had weeds in it. And then sometimes it would fall in the good soil. And so we have here the same sower, the good farmer. We have the same seed. It's a good seed. But the only variable we see in the parable is we have four types of soils. We have the path. We have the rocky soil. We have the weedy soil or the weed infested soil. And we have the good soil, which of course is the soil we want our hearts to be. So even as a non-agrarian culture, I think we can understand this. I mean, the, the first one's pretty easy. It's a path. The seed falls on that path. There is no soil. And what happens? Jesus says the birds come along and they eat the seed. If the bird eats the seed, it cannot produce fruit. The second soil, it's a, a rocky soil, a rocky underlay. And oftentimes the farmer, they would till, but they wouldn't get down deep enough. And so there'd be a little bit of soil, but underneath there'd be rock. And the seed would land in that. And what would happen? It would sprout quickly, usually because the rock underneath was warm and it would actually incubate the seed. And so it would pop up. But because the rock was there, it did not have roots. It could not draw down water. And therefore, when the sun would come out without its root base, the seed would be scorched and it would die. The third seed, it fell onto fertile soil also, but that soil had been contaminated, as we'll see next week, by weeds, thorns, another type of seed. And so when that, when that seed would come in, it would choke out the good seed so that it could not produce any fruit. And then there's the fourth soil. And when you heard Bill reading this, you probably said, that's me, that's my soil. I pray so, but don't be so quick to conclude that merely because you claim Christ or you're in church. The good soil is the soil we want to be. The good soil is where the seed goes in and the seed goes deep, and it grows roots, and it draws up nourishment. And what happens? It grows into a plant that can produce 30, 60, and a hundredfold. This is what we want in Christ. Now look at verse 9. So we understand the parable. It's pretty easy in terms of its, its initial uh, teaching. But then he says something in verse 9, which is intriguing. He says, he who has an ear, let him hear. You say, wait a minute, we, we just heard it read, you just described it, of course we understand it, but really we don't understand it. 
When Jesus says, he who has an ear, let him hear, that was a Hebrew phrase, and it literally meant there's a hidden meaning. There's something underneath this that Jesus wanted the crowds on the beaches to hear. Our Lord, as loving and gracious as he was, he was not giving farmers instruction on how to plant their crops. This was not his primary concern when he came to earth to make a lot of good grain farmers. He was teaching the true meaning of the kingdom of God. He was teaching to the gospel of grace, how it was going out, how it was being received. And so he says, he who has an ear, let, let him hear. And so I say that to you. Do not grow sleepy in the next 30 minutes. If you have an ear, let yourself hear the deeper meaning, the spiritual truth that God wants to convey through this parable of the sower and the seed. And specifically, how it is that the word goes out and how it's received that we might become children of God. Because that's what Christ is talking about here. And as children of God, how, how then can we live lives that bring him great honor and glory? So I wanna, I wanna look at three things from the parable. One, I wanna show you three enemies. I preached this passage before, and this is completely different than how I preached it before, which is what God does. One, I wanna show you three enemies. Number two, I wanna show you one friend. And then number three, I wanna show you some gospel realities about this parable that I pray we can take away from it. Number one, the three enemies. After explaining to his disciples why he taught and was teaching in parables in verses 10 through 17, look at verse 18. Jesus says, hear then the parable of the sower. He's already taught it. The disciples say to him, why are you teaching in parables? They're confused. And he says, let me explain to you now what this parable means. The seed in the parable is the gospel message. It is the message that God the Father sent God the Son to earth to die for the sins of many. It is the heart of the gospel, the seed that is going out, that Christ would come and exercise his rule over the hearts of men once again, and that ultimate promise that he'd come again in glory and he'd make all things new. So the seed is the gospel message. The soil, that's human hearts. That's the receptiveness of the message by every man, woman, and child. And of course, the sower is Christ. The sower is Christ, and through Christ, the disciples, and through the disciples, the church, we stand on the apostolic word. And so when you think of sower, think Christ first, think disciple second, and think of yourself third, because we are called to sow as well. And one of the first things that we see here in this parable is that this great message, this gospel message of God the Father sending the Son to die for the sins of many, that we might have eternal life, meets great resistance it wasn't as though the creation said, come Lord Jesus, come, and received him and placed him upon a throne in Zion. Quite the contrary. Look at verse 19. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. And so the first enemy, we see that hardened path we see not only is it the hard heart of the sinner, the one who refuses. Remember verse 14 from last week? Verse 14, you will, Jesus said, you will indeed hear but never understand because you don't want to understand. This is the heart that is so hardened to the gospel and so hardened to the things of God that when the gospel comes, no word is heard, blocked off completely. But there's another enemy in this. Did you see it? It's Satan himself. Satan comes along and he makes sure that that word does not linger upon that heart. That you're not going to meditate on it. You're not going to think about it. He comes and he grabs it and he takes it away. And he is a real enemy. Peter said in 1 Peter 5, be alert and sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. That's a real enemy. I imagine if a lion came in here right now, we wouldn't all be sitting quietly. We'd be scrambling to the door. Satan is a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And so in this first group, those on the path, the seed is sown, but it's, the heart is so hard that when it hits, Satan comes and he takes it away, he snatches it, ensuring no meditation, no contemplation on the word. Today, it's easy for him to do this in our culture. It's super easy. He comes along and that word, even when it, even when it has a bit of a tinge and your consciousness pricked on it, 
It's so easy today because all Satan has to do is say, well, remember, there is no God. In our culture, when we say, well, that's right. I was trained that K through 12, there is no God. I'm here by chance, I die by chance. I'm a product of primordial ooze over billions and billions of years, and that's how I'm here. And therefore, this gospel message about God being holy and Christ saving, I don't need to worry about. There is no God, therefore there is no judgment, there is no heaven, there is no hell. I reject the gospel. And so Satan takes it away that way, reminding us of what we've been taught. For others, he comes along and he says, oh no, you got to remember, you're not that bad. I mean, you, you're bad, but you're not that bad. You don't need a savior like Christ. You don't need someone going to the cross to die for your sins. And that's an easy one to cultivate as well, because we don't want to think we're that bad. We don't want to think we need God the Son to die for our sins, to be saved. And so Satan just says, oh, that's right. Whatever sins you have in your life, they're not deserving of hell. I mean, come on. That's a radical statement. And so he plucks the seed away of the gospel. Still others, Satan steals it away by reassuring them that by their own good works and their own merit, you can make it. Just get to church. Do enough good deeds. Give to the poor. Take care of your elderly parents, and you can make it to heaven on your own. You don't need Christ. You don't need salvation and a bloody crucified Savior. You can overcome your own sins. He plucks it away like that. Satan tells so many today that there is not just one way to heaven. There are multiple paths. Jesus may be one, but there are others. Just get on one. The second enemy of the gospel is our own flesh. Satan's number one. Number two, look at verse 20. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while and when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. So this person's interesting. They hear the gospel. They receive it, unlike the hardened path, with great joy. There's probably professions of faith. There's probably baptism going on here. And maybe even for a season, it looks like this person's going to thrive in the Lord, and much fruit will be produced. But we see quickly that there are no roots. Hebrews 4.12, the spirit does not divide soul and spirit, joint and marrow, judging the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. The word does not go in. It does not seat properly. In other words, it's a superficial faith. The superficial faith, the rocky soil, can, can pretend in good times, right? When things are comfortable, we can, we can look like we're participating. But when there's sacrifice or there's suffering, when our comfort is challenged or our safety questioned, when things become difficult and we suffer, this heart departs. This heart will hear Jesus say in John 15, 20, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, Jesus said, they will persecute you. We hear that in an academic sense and we believe it because the Bible says so. But for the rocky soil, when persecution comes, they leave. Enemy number one, Satan. Number two, the flesh. Enemy number three, look, verse 22, it's the world. Three enemies here. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. So for the third time, we see same sower, same good seed, but there's a problem with the soil. There's a problem with the heart that's receiving the gospel message. The seed goes in here, and again, there's likely a profession of faith, likely baptism, maybe even church membership, maybe even ministry early on, but something's happened. This seed was sown simultaneously with a thorny seed, with a weed or weeds attached to it, and so as it begins to grow, the weeds grow faster and stronger, and they literally, I love this, they, are, they choke out the good seed of the gospel itself. And then Christ gives us two things that will choke it out. And these are not new to us. The cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. The cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. So the cares of the world in a, in a first world country like ours... They're interesting things. They're not third world concerns like food and shelter. They're things like, where will I go to school? Who will I marry? What job will I take? Where will I live? All questions worthy of asking. 
But when these cares and these concerns supersede the kingdom of God and your concern for Christ and making disciples and being in your word and prayer, then you're finding yourself being choked out by these thorny weeds. When the cares become more important than the kingdom itself, we are in great danger. He adds to that the deceitfulness of riches. Now notice he does not say being rich. He says the deceitfulness of it. That can be the aspiration to be rich. It can be the acquisition of money. It can be saving money. It can be spending money. And all the false hope that money offers. Oh, what a powerful deception that is today in this culture, in, in this city where there's more money flying around. People are walking out and, and buying $1.5 million homes in cash. That doesn't happen in Louisville, Kentucky. Three enemies we see in this parable. Formidable enemies. Satan, your own flesh, and the world. So the first thing I want us to see and when we look at God's creation, fall, redemption story is that when this message came by Christ, when the gospel message came, it wasn't that there wasn't any resistance. There was great resistance then and is today and will be until he comes. Enemies that we must fight. Satan, the flesh, and the world. And we shouldn't be surprised that it's hard. In each of these cases, I want you to note this before we go to our next point. The first three soils are soils that are unsaved. These are hearts that were never made alive. So if you're sitting there right now thinking, no, wait a minute. I'm tempted by Satan. There are times when my flesh causes me to stumble. There are times when the world tempts me. I mean, there are times when I can barely make it through breakfast and I'm already knee deep in sin. So pastor, are you telling me that, that I must be one of these seeds? Not at all. Not at all. As a believer saved by grace, you will fight Satan, your own flesh, and the world until you come into his presence. But there's a distinction here that Christ is making. The first three soils, the first three hearts were hearts that remained dead. They never came alive. So we must see that so that we make sure that we're not deceived, that we're not deceived by Satan or our flesh, or the world, because their end, my beloved, is not salvation. Their end is judgment and condemnation. Those first three hearts that do not repent and believe before they take their last breath will come into the presence of God, but they will see God as a judge, not as a father. So the first thing I want you to see from this parable is that you have three enemies. You have them, and every soul born has them. Satan, the flesh, and the world. The second thing I want you to see, which is the glorious truth, that we have a friend that battles these enemies for us. Point number two, I pray you're still with me. Our friend. I, I love thinking of Christ as my friend. I, I don't get me wrong, I love thinking as my king and my savior. I do. But there's something about the intimacy of hearing someone say, Christ is my best friend. He, he loves me like that. And then he loves you like that if you're in him. I want to show you this friend from this parable because it will cause your heart to soar if you know him. The spiritual meaning behind this passage that he wants us to convey is that the good soil is made by him if you're thinking this, and I pray you're not, but if you are, let me correct it right now. If you're thinking, this is a brutal teaching, and it's impossible then for us to be saved. If you're thinking, Pastor, are you telling me that, that I have Satan as my enemy, the most formidable enemy in the known universe? I have to battle him and overcome him with my own heart? And are you telling me that I have to overcome my own flesh, my own sinful desires, when I can't get through five minutes without sinning, and when I look upon this world, pastor, are you telling me that I have to somehow figure out how to overcome the temptations of the world, the pride, the money, all the trappings? If your conclusion is that is impossible, you are right. And that's not what Jesus is saying. He's not saying those Stony, weed-filled hearts make your hearts good. You cannot. The disciples got this. Jesus 
said to his disciples, the disciples actually said to Christ in Luke 18, 26, because they were getting the, the, the magnitude of this, they said, well, who can be saved? We can't overcome Satan, I can't overcome my flesh, and I certainly can't overcome the world, not for a minute, let alone a day or a year or the rest of my life. So I have no hope. And then Christ comes along in Luke 18, 27, and says what? What is impossible with man is possible with God. So in hearing this parable, if you find yourself in that fourth group, and I pray you do, if your heart is good soil, know that it's Christ doing. Look again with me at verse 23. As for what was sown on good soil, that's the regenerate heart, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundred, in another sixty, and in another thirty. If this is you, my beloved, then you must know that at some point in time you heard the word of God, you heard the gospel message, you heard that Jesus Christ was delivered over to death, Romans 4.25, for your sins, and he was raised to life for your justification. You say, well, that sounds very theological and very heady. I'll make it real simple. Jesus Christ died for your sins so that by grace through faith, you Sinner can be presented before God, holy and blameless and beyond reproach, righteous, justified, not coming before God, judged and condemned, but justified as sinless because of the atoning sacrifice of Christ. In other words, he makes your soil good, not only to receive the word, to be sanctified by it, and then one day we're going to come into his presence, my beloved, and you will be glorified in Christ, holy as he is holy. The Bible says you will see him and be as he is. Man, <laughs> I, so, I need that so bad. If you're the good soil, it's not your doing. If you're the good soil, it's not your doing. God made your soil good. And you, you must know, if it is true that every man has three enemies, Satan, his own flesh, and the world, then you must know that your education is not sufficient to overcome those three enemies. You must know that your upbringing, your bank account, your degrees, you must know that your own free will is not sufficient to overcome the power of Satan and your flesh and the world. That is a reasonable conclusion testified to in Scripture over and over and over again. That's why Christ had to say to Nicodemus, Verily, verily, I say unto you, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Can't even see it, let alone enter it. Won't understand. Paul reminded the church of Ephesus, in Ephesus, of this simple salvific truth that we all are young and old educated and ill-educated, rich and poor, we all start off in the exact same place, dead in our sins, dead in our transgressions, in 100% rebellion against God. This is how all mankind begins. And we would all suffer the same fate of those first three soils, the path, the rocky soil, the weed-infested soil, which is judgment and condemnation, if not for God making our soil good if not for God intervening. And what does the Bible says? He takes our hearts of stone and he turns them to hearts of flesh. He takes these hard, shallow, weed-infested hearts by pure grace and he makes them fertile. He tills the soil of your heart. He fertilizes it. He prepares it. He brings the word. He plants it. He waters it. He grows it. It's all him. It's all him. Ephesians 2, verses 1 and following, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you followed what? Listen to this. Paul affirms our Lord's enemies. In which you follow the ways of this world, the ruler of the kingdom of the air, that's Satan, gratifying the cravings of your flesh. All three enemies identified in Ephesians chapter 2. We all start off with infertile plots of land, slaves to the world, slaves to Satan, and slaves to our own flesh. No place for the gospel to come in and take root and grow. And yet, verse 4, Ephesians 2, but, it's one of those glorious buts in Scripture, but because, listen to this, listen, 
If you were once the path, the hardened path, that was me. I couldn't for a minute meditate on the word of God. I hated it so much. Or maybe you were raised in the church. Maybe you're the rocky soil where it came in and you had these flashes of, su of submission and love, but then they just disappeared whenever persecution came. Or maybe right now you're in that situation where the cares of the world are overcoming you. You say, I don't know the good soil yet. Listen to this. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, did what? He made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace, it is by grace you have been saved. God did this work in us. He made the soil of your heart good if it is good. If it is good. And so if you identify yourself as the fertile soil, if in fact the gospel has gone in, and I pray it has, and if you've seen in your life fruit, real spiritual fruit, grace and mercy and sacrifice and service and an abounding love for the Savior and one another, if you've seen it 30, 60, 100-fold in your life, then you must say, Christ is my greatest friend because he's the one who accomplished this great work. It was by Christ laying down his life to overcome your enemies. Christ laid down his life to overcome the power of Satan. Christ laid down his life to overcome the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. Christ laid down his life so that your sinful desires might be crucified and put to death and you be made new. You have a friend, my beloved, who decided before anything ever was that he was going to redeem you. Before anything was ever created, you have a friend who said and declared before you ever did anything good or bad, I will love this one. I will put my gospel love on this one. And that's a saving love. Not just a temporary feeling of, of oh, that's a, that's a warm fuzzy for Christ, but a permanent, lasting relationship. You have a friend who has set you free from the slavery of Satan from the power of your own sin. He has set you free from the temptations of this world so that you might walk in righteousness, my beloved. That's a friend. You have a friend who has not only redeemed you out of the darkness into the light of his glorious kingdom, but he has made promises to you which are so extraordinary. He says, I'm gonna bring you into my kingdom and you're gonna sit with me at my table. You're gonna eat with Christ. You're gonna enjoy Christ. The Bible says you're going to actually sit with Christ at the right hand of the Father and rule over the universe. That's a good friend. That's a friend that I want. That's a friend that I want you to have. You have a friend that according to the counsel of his own will decided to decisively and permanently rewrite your story. Your story started before Christ. You were the path. You were the rocky soil. You were the weed-infested soil. You were debt-bound for judgment and condemnation. And Christ came in and said, I'm going to rewrite this one. I'm going to take my broken body and my spilled blood, and with my blood, I'm going to rewrite that story for that one, for you, for me. And he rewrites it by writing our name in the Lamb's Book of Life. And if you've never heard about that story, that's the book you want to be in. You don't necessarily want to be in the San Jose Mercury News. You don't necessarily want to be that best-selling author. You don't want to have your name as the CEO of that top company. You want your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Because the, according to God's story, only those names that are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, only those have eternal life in God. Only those will be saved. And so if you know Christ, then that is your guarantee and your hope that you will have him. You'll have Christ, his joy and satisfaction as a son or a daughter forever. So the parables reveal three enemies, Satan, flesh, and the world. One glorious, eternal, most powerful friend, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who overcame Satan, your flesh, and the world to save you. I told you it's a good parable, is it not? All right. So with those truths before us, three enemies and one glorious friend, what are the gospel realities that come down on us? If this parable is to open up a window 
into God's story? What are we to take away from it? I mean, I want you to, I want you to have a greater sense of God's love for you in Christ as your friend. I want you to rejoice in the great work that he accomplished that you might love him more and in loving him more, want to follow him more obediently. And I want you to see by his grace some gospel realities that should impact today for you and tomorrow for you. Are you still with me? That was not a good yes. Are you still with me? Thank you. Better. I need a little encouragement here, okay? Come on. Point number three, the gospel reality. This parable brings light to the teaching on how we are to relate in many ways. And I want to just highlight a few, the world, the church, and yourself. I, I want us to look at this parable in light of how do we engage the world and how do we engage one another in this church and, and how do I engage myself daily in Christ? If in fact I am the good soil, if God's done that in my life. First, how does the parable impact the way we relate to the world? According to God's story, every man, woman, and child ever born begins in sin and is subject to the consequence of sin, separation from God and eternal judgment. Paul made that clear in Romans 5, 12. Sin entered the world through Adam and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. Now, if that's true, if every person we know enters this world and engages in sin, then every person enters with all three enemies, Satan, the flesh, and the world, doing everything they can to keep that person out of the kingdom. It is a war on a scale we cannot imagine. It is a battle for the souls of men and women and children. If that's true, that those enemies are there and that they need the cosmic friend Jesus Christ to overcome them, if that is true, that they need the Savior who takes away the sins of the world, John 1, 29, and every person without Christ will be condemned, then we must conclude that they what? They need to hear the gospel. They need to hear and understand it and receive it that they too might have eternal life. In other words, the seed has to go out. We must become sowers. We must become farmers in this plot of land, which is a very hard land to sow seed in. But if we don't become their friends and introduce them to our friend Jesus, how will they hear, how will they repent, how will they believe, and how will they be saved? If we don't become friends with the lost and share with them our friend Jesus Christ, then their end will be one of those three soils that ends in judgment and condemnation. Now the cynic in you might say this, I heard what you said about the parable, and if this is true, then what does it matter? I mean, you said that God had to make the soil good. You said he has to plant the seed, water the seed, grow the seed, and bear the fruit. Then what does it matter? Why should I say anything to anybody? Because they're gonna remain dead unless he makes them alive. And that's independent of me. And that's partly true, and it's partly not. It is true that a man must be born again by the Holy Spirit to hear and receive the word of God. That is true. But there's another truth that God gives us, and that is by the Holy Spirit, he makes men alive by what? By hearing the word of God. From whom? From you, from me, from our lips, from his church. The word of God is to be sown widely by us so the Holy Spirit can take that glorious gospel, saving truth and make people alive just as you were made alive. Someone shared it with you. You, maybe it was church, maybe it was Sunday school, maybe it was your best friend. Said, oh, have you heard of my best friend? Have you heard about my cosmic friend, Jesus Christ? Let me tell you the story. I had read Romans 10, and I want us to hear it again. Here's the promise from the Apostle Paul. Everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without what? Without someone preaching. And that's not from the pulpit. That's you preaching 
teaching, sharing the gospel. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. They have to hear to repent and believe. In order to hear, the seed must be sown. You gotta become a farmer. You gotta become a farmer. God's tilling soil. He's doing work in soil right now. And we are to go out and scatter that seed as widely as you can. And don't look at people and say, hard path, rocky soil, too many weeds, no hope. No such person. Because we were all those people. And yet someone sowed the seed with us and it went in and we were made alive. During my 11 years at De Anza, I had the chance, I think, to share the gospel with hundreds of kids over 11 years. Glorious opportunities for evangelism. Most of them rejected it. Most rejected it. And I had a chance to see the seeds being played out in my students' life. Some say, I, I don't want to hear that at all. Hard path. Some actually would come here and get baptized, and then persecution from family and friends would take place, and they would flee rocky path. Others would come in, and they would do the same thing. They'd get baptized and start attending, but I would see the world come in and squeeze and choke, and then they would go away. But there were a few. There were a few who received the gospel word from my sinful lips that God was actually doing a mighty work on and giving them good soil, and the seed went in, and they bear fruit even today. But they had to hear it. They had to hear it. So... I, I, the most fundamental piece I want you to hear, this parable tells us with the world to evangelize. We got to sow. We got to sow. I would argue that there are, there are many types of soils in your life right now, many of whom who've never heard the gospel message. Some have heard about Christ. Some have read a little bit of their Bible. Some have attended church maybe, but many have never heard the full gospel message. You got to sow it. You got to sow it. How should this parable impact life in the church? How should it impact? If it's the world evangelism, what about inside these walls? Several thoughts came to mind, but I got to narrow it down for the sake of time. One in particular. Three of the four soils are in the church. You know that. Three of the four soils come into the church at some point in time. The rocky soil, the weed-infested soil, and the good soil, they commingle in the church. The rocky soil sprouts up, receives the gospel, great joy, persecution comes, they wither away, they die, they were never made alive. Now that's an interesting type of soil in our historical moment, at least in the Western world. It is likely that many churches on this Sunday morning in the United States are filled with people with rocky, soiled hearts. Why? There's really no persecution. I mean, what did it take for you to get here this morning? You got in your car, many of you, and you drove to church. No one was shooting at you. Right? You didn't come in here under the veil of darkness and worry that you're going to be arrested upon coming. Most of us are going to be able to stay and take communion and enjoy a fellowship meal and then leave without any concern of being arrested, persecuted, tortured, or put to death. So there's really no persecution in the Western world. And you say, what a blessing. And in fact, it is. But there's a, a consequence to that, that our churches today are filled, I do believe, with many rocky soiled hearts because there's nothing that's testing their fidelity. There's no sun of persecution to see whether or not any roots have really gone in and gone deep. I mean, it's easy to come and hear the message and get baptized and join the church, but if there's no persecution, how do you know the, persec how do you know the roots have gone in? How do you know you're firm in the faith? How do you know? Many of you have heard the story. I've told it before. I'll tell it again. It's just too good. During the former reign of the Soviet Union, some Red Army officials who are believers in Christ came into a church gathering, underground church gathering, with their AK-47s, and they said, all right, whoever's a real Christian, whoever's not a real Christian, you got to leave because we're going to kill the Christians here. And then half the room exited. They closed the doors, and they said, we just wanted to make sure who was sincere. We wanted to know who the real believers were because they were too. Without persecution, we do not know. A warning to you, my beloved. Know that the roots have gone in know that you're bearing fruit. The church may also be filled, according to this parable, with seeds that have been 
weed saturated. Look at verse 22 again. The cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful. So this is a person who's made a profession. They've come into the church. Maybe they've, they've become a member, but their life is not bearing fruit. No service, no ministry, no transformation of heart and mind. No gospel love, no compassion for the lost, no care for the brothers and sisters. So much of life is still about that individual. And with churches refusing to exercise church discipline, I believe this is a type of soil that can go a long time in a church. I believe we have sw swaths of people in the church today with this type of weed-infested soil. Those who live their lives more about the cares of this world. Now listen, I believe if I were to pick one that we're in most danger of today, this would be it for us. So please listen. Cares about status and comfort and looks and security. Cares and concerns about education and work and homes that supersede your cares about the kingdom. Holiness. Discipleship. Evangelism, sacrifice, service, prayer, ministry, gospel love. How many in the church today hear Jesus say this, Matthew chapter 6, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. I'll rephrase that. Do not be anxious about your school or where you're going to go to school, or the degree that you're going to take, or when you will finish. Do not be anxious about your work, how much money you're making, the promotion you're going to get, your next job. Do not be anxious about whether or not you can afford to live in the Bay Area. Listen, if God called you here to do ministry, stay here and do ministry. He'll take care of the rest. I am. I'm, I'm tired as a pastor, and I know Pastor Kurt is, of hearing, I can't afford it. I can't afford it. No, most of us can't. It's hard here. I get that. The cares of the kingdom need to supersede the cares of this world. If God wants you here to do ministry, it may mean you can't buy a house. It may mean you struggle with rent. But are you seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness and all those other things he'll take care of? Jesus said the Gentiles seek after all these things, food, clothes, work, school, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. And then he says in verse 25, if n is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? And then he says this word, let's memorize it. Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the other things will be added. What things? All the cares you have. All the schooling, all the education, the degrees, the job, the money, the homes, the family, all those things you worry about. He says, stop worrying, stop fixating, focus on Christ, the kingdom, his righteousness, and the father, he's a good father, he says, I'll take care of the rest. I'll take care of it. Oh, do we need to hear this, my beloved. So many excuses about why we can't gather, why we can't disciple, why we can't evangelize, and they're all excuses. It's a lack of faith in our Heavenly Father to provide. Seek His kingdom first. Seek His righteousness first. And then He'll take care of the rest. He's a good Father. He's a good Father. So when we put school over church, listen, work over discipleship, entertainment over ministry, materialism over giving, you're in thorny soil. Be careful it doesn't choke you out. So the gospel reality tells us two things inside the church as well. If, if we have rocky, thorny soil here too, along with the good soil, we need to evangelize in the church. I know that sounds strange, doesn't it? But if this parable is true, and I would say in the context of our cultural moment, we probably have a lot of rocky, weedy soils in the church today. We got to evangelize in the church. Don't assume because someone comes to church, makes a profession, becomes a member, they're necessarily Christians. Do you see fruit? So we got to evangelize. And I would add to that what we learn in 2 Timothy 3, 5, have nothing to do with those in the church who have a form of godliness but deny its power. Be very careful, my beloved. Be very careful. All right, lastly, and I'll close. I know I'm long and I'm sorry. Too much here. I don't even feel like I did a service <laughs> and I'm long. What about you? You see how the world needs evangelism according to this parable. 
in the church evangelism too, and we got to be on guard because we might have rocky and weedy soil. And so when things are hard in the church, you say, why is it like this? Why is there so much struggle and strife? Because we have different soils commingling. God will straighten that out in the end. We'll see that next week. What about you? What about you, my beloved? What does this parable have to say to you personally and your walk with Jesus Christ? The parable ends with a description of of the transforming power of the gospel. Did you notice that? It ends with every man giving an account before God. The Bible says that everyone will give an account for their life before God. And those in the good soil, those who have been made alive by Christ, the grain will be a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. In other words, the gospel, this parable ends with the end. When all is said and done, all of humanity, the living and the dead will be raised and brought before God. Some, my beloved, who have been made alive and have the good soil of the gospel itself sown into their hearts, they will have much to present before God. Others will have nothing. There'll be some who with the gospel planted in deep will flourish 30, 60, 100 fold My beloved, you want to say right now, I want that to be me. I want to be that good soil. I want that seed to go deep. I want it to be watered. I want it to be nourished by the word and prayer. I want it to be bathed in community. I want to be discipled. I want to make disciples. I want to share the gospel with everyone I know. I want to give and I want to sacrifice and I want to serve because I love Christ so much. If that is your heart's desire, that is God's will for you as well. So you can, you can pray, Lord, thy will be done. And he'll say, okay. And then by his grace, you'll come before him on that day. Matthew 25, 23. And you will hear him say, listen. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. You say, not only is he going to bless you immeasurably for all eternity, but you get to come into and enjoy the presence of your master, your Lord, your Savior, your friend, Jesus Christ forever. That will be the end for those of the good soil. There will be those who never let the word go in, the seed that fell on the path. There'll be those who never let the word take root, the seed in the rocky soil. There'll be those who smothered the produce, smothered the good seed with all the cares and concerns and deceitfulness of riches in this world. To them, God will say something very different. Now listen, I want you to think of all those in your mission field right now that do not know Christ, that you know do not know Christ. I want you to think about all those co-workers, family members, neighbors who have never heard the gospel. To them, Jesus will say, from the one who has not, no gospel, no seed, even what he has will be taken, verse 30, Matthew 25, and they will what? Cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness in that place where there is the weeping and the gnashing of teeth. That's the end for those without Christ. That's the end of the story for those without Christ. And so Jesus is so gracious. He gives us a glimpse in this parable of the end. Right now, he shows it to us. Why? So that we can examine ourselves right now and say, am I pursuing Christ? Is Jesus my life? Ask yourself, how are you treating the implanted word of God that you professed when you came to saving grace and were baptized? How are you treating it? Are you, are you watering it? Are you fertilizing it? Are you nourishing it? Are you pruning it? Everyone hears, everyone in the church will hear this parable and say to themselves, I am the good soil. Everyone will hear and think that, but not everyone will be right. Ask yourself, is your heart filled with such gratitude and love for your friend Jesus Christ that you do not want to remain fruitless. If Christ did not leave you dead, why stay dead? If Christ made you alive, why not live as though you're alive? And I would argue for all of us, that would be a dramatically different life than we're living right now.
Are you seeking the kingdom of God more than the cares of this world? It's yes or no. Are you seeking the righteousness of God more than your bank account? It's a yes or no. The answer to this is a gospel answer. To say, yes, I am pursuing Christ with all my life. I am struggling, I am failing, but I'm getting up and I'm running. That's a good answer. That's the one you want. To not know is not good. The more you open up your heart to the word of God, the deeper the seed goes. The more you spend time with your Lord in his word, in prayer, in community, in discipleship, in ministry, the deeper it goes, the deeper the root score, and the more fruit you bear. We can, my beloved, test to see, as Paul said, whether or not we're in the faith. Is there fruit in your life? If the answer is no, then repent and believe today. Don't say, oh, there's no fruit. I must be the rocky soil. I must be the weed-infested soil. Repent and believe today and be made alive and receive the good seed. And if the answer is yes, I'm producing fruit. If it's 30, make it 60. If it's 60, make it 100-fold. Because it's all for the glory of God. It's all for his glory. When he says to you, well done, good and faithful servant, you'll say, all glory to Christ. He did that in me. My beloved, I pray that you go back and read this parable again. Examine your life, your relationship with the church, and your relationship with the world. That we might have ears to hear and actually hear. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we want that window into the larger reality of your story to be made known to us through this parable. I ask that you would not leave us deaf and blind. I know, Father, that even now some will hear this today, and it may have been received, and there may be initial joy, but the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and a little persecution will wipe it clean, and we will wake up tomorrow morning as though we never heard any of this. Let that not be so. Let this parable go in deep. Water it, Father. Grow it deep in our hearts. Uh, have your church here at Cambrian Park be immeasurably blessed by growing closer in their love relationship with your son, Jesus Christ, so that we can be the people that bless others. We want to be a church that blesses others with the gospel. Open our mouths, Lord. Untie our tongues Give us the courage and the boldness to tell people about our best friend, Jesus Christ, because he is, and he can be to them if they repent and believe. I praise you for the gathering of the saints here this morning, Father. We pray for all those who are unable to be here this morning. We ask that you would grant them safe travels as they return to our community and our fellowship. And I ask that you would use the ordinance of the broken body and the spilled blood to draw us even nearer to you. In Christ's name, amen.